Hey there, pre-med. In this video, we're gonna figure out what on earth they mean by calculating a rate law and how to define each part of the rate law as it applies to reaction kinetics. We all know about reactions in general and organic chemistry. We have two things that can displace each other. We can have combination reactions where two things combine together. We can have a double displacement where two things flip spots. We can have a combustion reaction where we form carbon dioxide and water. There are a lot of different types of reactions, but all of them rely on the rules of reaction kinetics. Kinetics is all about the speed of the reaction. When we think about kinetics, I want you to think initial speed, rate limiting reactant, and of course, the rate law. So when we talk about rate laws, what we're really saying is, how fast is this thing going? How fast is this reaction going? The rate meaning the speed. Now in our physical mechanical world, when we say speed, we're talking about velocity, meters per second. When we're talking about reactions, when we refer to rate, we're referring to molarity per second or concentration per second. Basically, how fast those reactants get used up and consequently, how fast do we make products? Now, when we do these calculations, we are reactant focused. Reactants are the things at the beginning of the reaction. Products are the thing at the end that we produce. So what we're gonna be talking about today is all about reactants. We actually don't include products when we're talking about rate laws or calculating the rate law constant given a table. The last thing we need to talk about before we get to a practice question is collision theory. Collision theory basically states that the only way we get reactions is two things colliding into each other. If they can't physically collide, they're not going to react. And thinking about this conceptually, it is a lot more likely for one thing to connect with one other thing than for three things to simultaneously react together. So let's say that I have this cup and this mouse. If they were to react, they just need to hit each other at some point. That's not unlikely, right? If they're floating around in space at some point, boom, they're gonna collide. But what if, and I only have two hands, this already makes it harder, what if I had my pen, the mouse, and my cup? What's the likelihood that all three of their trajectories line up so that they collide in exactly the right orientation, exactly simultaneously? Pretty unlikely. So what we're going to focus on in this video is first and second order reactions, which are really about a single reactant or two reactants reacting together. We're not really going to talk about the higher orders because they are so unlikely to happen in our biological systems. Let's go ahead and get started, as always, with a question to prime us so we can walk through it together. Okay, give this question a read and a shot on your own first, and then we'll walk through it together. Okay, so the question states, given the rate table below, what is the rate law for the reaction of A plus 2B reacts to being the product to C? So this could have been anything. They could have given us hydrogens and heliums or salts, right? So it doesn't really matter what the reaction is. What matters is the information in the table here and what our rate law equation is going to be. So when they ask you for rate law, what they're really asking us to determine is which if any, reactants matter for the rate. So our rate law is going to tell us which concentrations matter and in what quantities. When we do a rate law, first rules first, we always do rate equals K. K is the rate constant. Sometimes questions will ask you to calculate rate constant. So we'll go ahead and do a derivative of this question where we're asked for the rate constant, and we'll be able to walk through it together. We're always gonna include rate equals rate constant, which is a constant of the equation. And then we have to figure out which reactants are involved in the reaction. So a simple way to think about this is, hey, if I change the concentration of the reactant, does the rate change? In order to determine this, we need to actually do kinetic experiments. So these kinetic experiments are where we set a certain concentration for each reactant, and then we measure the rate, again, in molarity per second. Remember, concentration per second. Molarity is moles per liter. So we're saying, hey, here's the concentration of each reactant, and then here's the rate in concentration per second. So you can see here we've done three trials and we've been manipulating the different concentrations and measuring the rate. So how do we read this rate table to figure out which reactants matter? Well, what we really need to do is say, okay, if we change just one reactant, does that affect the rate? In order to do that, we need to hold the other reactant constant. So let's start by holding a constant between two trials. 
right? So in trial one and trial two, both of those trials had the same concentration of reactant A. That means we're holding it constant, right? It's not gonna change. So now we compare holding A constant, let's see what happened to B. What did we do to B's concentration between trial one and trial two? You said multiply by two, you're absolutely correct. So we doubled the concentration of B. What happened to the rate when we did so? The rate also doubled, right? We multiplied it by two. So what this tells us is that B did have an impact on rate because when we held A constant and we doubled B, rate doubled too. So not only do we know that, yes, B is involved in this rate law, it's important, but we also know that it's a linear relationship, one-to-one -one relationship. So when we write that in the rate, we'll write concentration of B, and then to show the relationship, we use that as a superscript, which in this case will be one because it's a linear relationship. If, I'm not saying it is here, but if this had been two, then what we would have said is, hey, when we double B, now we have a four times increase on rate. And so doubling equals quadrupling. That's known as an exponential relationship, right? So in that case, our rate law would have been B squared because it has a squared relationship, right? When we doubled B, our outcome of our rate was four times, which means we need to have a square as our exponent. So that's not what happened here in this relationship, right? We just had a linear relationship, but just be aware, if you double one concentration and you end up with quadrupling the rate, that's a concentration squared relationship. In this case, it was linear. Now let's go ahead and see if A also is, has an impact. We'll go ahead and we need to hold now B constant, right? To compare the A's. So between trials two and three, we held B constant. So now what happened between trial two and three for the concentration of A? Yep, we doubled it, right? And what happened to the rate? When we doubled A, it also doubled. So A also has a linear relationship that impacts the rate. It's changing the rate when we change the concentration. So it too needs to be included in the rate law. Again, in the other direction, if we had doubled A, let's say we had doubled A from two to four, but then our rate here stayed one to one, what that would mean is that A does not impact the rate. And what we denote that as is A to the zero or just one, and it's not actually included in the rate law. So if we double or quadruple or change the concentration of one of our reactants and we do not see a change in rate, that means that it's not involved in the rate law. And we do not include it, even though it's there in the reaction. What we say there is it's not limiting to the rate, right? It's not the rate limiting reactant. So this actually lets us know that both A and B together are part of this rate limiting step that's important for this reaction to occur. So conceptually, that's what this is telling us. So now let's put it together for our question. We know that the rate equals K, A to the one, B to the one. So just A times B. So that's gonna give us our answer here, B. A would have been true if between trials one and two, the rate did not change, right? Not doubling, doubling B did not change the rate. That would have given us an answer A. C is never gonna happen. We're actually never going to divide the reactant concentrations, okay? So we're not gonna see uh, anything like C for our rate law. And then D would be true, again, for that example here, if we didn't change the rate between trials two and three when we doubled A. So that would have said only B is involved. Great work if you got that question right. There are more nuances to rate law and rate kinetics on the MCAT, specifically around the rate constant. What are the units for the rate constant given a certain order of reaction, and how could we calculate the rate given the information in a table? That's what we'll cover next. Before we do so, my name is Amanda Bram, and I've been coaching pre-med students on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test-taking strategy, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on test day. And if you'd like more interactive lessons on topics like these alongside test day prep and a collaborative environment to learn your skills, please check out my next available live online course. It's linked in the caption below. All right, let's dive back into rate laws by focusing on that rate constant. 
Okay, we're back in this question, but I actually want to use this question to break down a few more key ideas. Specifically, what is a first order and a second order reaction? A first order reaction is where only one reactant matters. Only one reactant is affecting the reaction rate. So we call a first order reaction one where we only have one reactant matters. A second order reaction has two reactants that matter. Now what's important to know here is these can be two reactants like A and B, like hydrogen gas and ammonia, or it can be two moles of the same reactant combining together. So two moles of water combining together. So how do we tell what we're looking at? We can actually use the rate law that we determined in our previous exercise. So we can look at the rate, and if you remember, we had added the superscripts one and one to the concentrations of A and B to denote that it was a linear relationship between concentration and the rate change. So all you have to do to figure out the order is add the superscripts together. So if the superscripts add up to an answer of two, like they do here, one plus one equals two, that means it's second order. If the superscripts add up to one, like they would for A and D, that is a first order reaction. And if you had something like rate equals Ka squared, which again would be denoted if we doubled A and then quadrupled the rate. If this rate was one to four for a two to four change here, right? This is a times two and this is a times four. And let's say that there was no rate change for these guys. I'll just change the numbers here briefly. All right, so what we're seeing now, quick look with my new numbers, when I doubled B, nothing happened, right? Rate stayed one to one. That means B is not involved in our new rate law with these new numbers. But if we have an answer of four for trial three, that means that when we doubled A, we quadrupled the rate, which means it's got a squared relationship, right? So if we have this kind of situations, the superscript is still two, which means it's second order. So all you have to do is just look at the superscripts and that lets you know what order we're looking at. Now, our final thing is what is the value of K? And quite simply, this is just a little rearranging of the equation using the units that are applied. So what do I mean by that? In a first order reaction, we have rate equals K, and then I'll just use A here to the one. So if I was to determine the relationship for K, all we need to do is divide both sides by the concentration of A, right? So our equation for K, if, we were to, if they asked you on the MCAT, hey, what would be the right equation for the rate constant for a first order reaction? Our equation would just be K equals rate over our reactant that matters, right? Now in terms of the units, remember rate is in molarity per second, and A is in molarity. So guess what? The molarities cancel, and our K for a first order reaction is one over seconds, or seconds to the negative one. So it's not magic, it's truly just canceling out units. For a second order reaction, we'll do the same thing. Right, so rate equals K times A, and again, in this case, I'll just do A times B just to make it real obvious, but the same would be true if we used A squared, same math applies. So now we divide both sides by concentration of A times concentration of B. So now, simplifying this out, we have K equals rate over the concentration of A times the concentration of B. And again, if we look for units, Rate is in molarity per second, and each of these concentration is in molarity, right? So molarity times molarity. So again, one of these molarities cancel, but now we have a molarity on the denominator. So it'll end up being one over molarity times seconds, or as it's more often written, molarity to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. So if they ask you for a second order rate constant, if they ask you for the equation, or the unit, now you have both. So for a first order, the unit is seconds to the negative one, and for second order, the units are molarity to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. It's not a mystery, it's not something to memorize necessarily, it's truly just rearranging our rate equation. 
I hope that was helpful for you. Again, rate laws are all about reaction kinetics. So if they ask you about thermodynamics, we're not even in this category. This is something that often connects to catalysts or enzymes in the biobiochem section. So you may see rate law tables and equations alongside enzyme kinetic concepts in a passage or in a question stem. I hope this was helpful and as always, happy studying.